the veneer of civilized society is much thinner than many people maybe think it is. I think that was actually one of the larger takeaways of Apocalypse Now is like, you put anyone in these conditions, like they are capable of massacring yeah. that ship of Vietnamese. Moral injury is basically what happens when people uh, violate their own conscience. PTSD, it's not necessarily something that happened to them that, that triggered this, but it's something that they did, that they sort of acted out of their own conception of their moral character. Solzhenitsyn, right? It's like the, the yeah. line between good and evil runs between every human. If you, if you make a movie that condemns something, if you make it too cool, you actually have like this backfire effect. What's interesting about all these films is they're all from American directors. The Vietnamese people have almost no talking parts in any of these films. Even if some of the films are quite anti-war, the only Vietnamese speaking part is when they massacre a boat. The bargain is I'll pay my taxes, I'll be a good citizen. Now, you gotta protect me. And a lot of these movies, even Apocalypse Now, was kind of a collective breakdown of the social contract. Why are you letting all of this violence run amok? Well, hello everyone, it's Jim O'Shaughnessy with another Infinite Loops with two of my favorite people, Trung Fan, Rob Henderson. Today's episode, believe it or not, we gave Rob some homework yeah. assignment on our last chat because Trung and I were like, frankly, flabbergasted that he had never seen Apocalypse Now. Possibly one of the greatest movies about war, and it doesn't have to be the Vietnam War. It's about it's actually based on Conrad's Heart of Darkness, very different war. Uh, but then we also added for extra credit, and of course Rob, being Rob, did all of the extra credit. The even better, in my opinion, documentary of the making of Apocalypse Now, because. Basically, Jed McKenna, who I love to quote uh, extensively, devoted a big section of one of his books to doing an analysis of uh, you know, Coppola's own Heart of Darkness and all of the horrible things that actually happened to him when he was trying to make that great movie. But I'm going to first, Trung, do you want to get a word in before Rob uh, gives his dissertation for yeah, all so of our viewers. <laughs> for listeners, uh, to add context to uh, Jim's uh, a very nice introduction there was, so Rob has written extensively on the TV shows he watches and like the films he watches. And there's always like, he always brings in the psychology element, the human psychology element. And I'm just like, man, this dude is going to love Apocalypse Now. So like, I'm ready <laughs> for him to cook for the next hour. Like, If you don't hear me again for the next hour, that, which is a, typically a rarity in podcasts, like, I can just motor on. You know, a lot of really, really empty thoughts, verbal diarrhea. But I'm ready this time just to hear uh, Rob's thoughts. And I, I do have quite a few thoughts about uh, uh, Apocalypse Now, but I'd love to get the human psychology element from uh, from Rob here. Well, Perfect. I should say, because you guys are, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're setting the expectation that's too high. Um, you know, you guys have told, you know, you told me to watch this movie, uh, was it almost a year ago, I think, when we, when we last spoke. Um, and you gave me this assignment, watch, watch Apocalypse Now, watch Heart of Darkness. So I watched Apocalypse Now pretty much right away. And then it took me a while to find uh, Heart of Darkness. Jim, Jim sent me the, the link. And and then I, I read uh, the Jed McKenna essay uh, in this book here that Jim Jim was a uh, uh, very kind of send. And yeah, I mean, like the, all of the piece. I mean, I, I don't know if I was particularly. It all made sense. Everything in that documentary made sense to me. I mean, even the the trajectory of the the main character, uh, Captain Willard. You know, he he sort of starts out the movie. Uh, I, sort of in a bout of of what PTSD or shell shock or whatever they call it during that era, right? Like they're they're having to clean him up and wipe him down and shower him because he's just in like a, a state of disrepair. And it's only through sort of giving him this mission to find Colonel Kurtz that he suddenly is able to clean up his act and become focused and determined once again and sort of return to this mission of, you know, I, I think Jed McKenna describes it as sort of a journey into the interior and through that process of of discovering the darkness of the jungle and i guess in a way this is sort of a um an, an allegory of him confronting his own darkness that he's able to sort of piece himself together again i guess that was that was sort of one way 
one way of reading it. Um, and then, yeah, to, to see, you know, the, 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 the documentary where Coppola, like from the outset, he's like, this is going to be a horrible movie. I already know it's going to suck. Like, this is the end of me. And, you know, the longer this, at one point in the, in the documentary, he even says something like, everyone says, you know, oh, Coppola is going to come through. He works best in a crisis. He's like, they're all wrong. This is going to be terrible. And, uh, yeah, it was really interesting, like to, to see it all come together. So I watched the, um, the, the director's cut, like the uncut, it was like three plus hours. That's the one that I watched. And my understanding is that there, there are two different, I don't know if there are two different endings, but there are two different scenes near the end where one version of the ending, the one that I watched is after Willard kills Colonel Kurtz, uh, and sort of observes this kind of, uh, this cult that he created, he just sort of sails away and leaves them be. But then in another version, it was this the, the theatrical cut. My understanding is that he actually bombs it. Like Willard orders that whole like cult area of like all of the natives who have were were adherents of Colonel Kurtz. He just has the the whole like area destroyed as like uh, a way to sort of remove this this sort of uh, uh, the, yeah the, this cult like uh, settlement. Uh, maybe as a way to sort of illuminate it from himself as well. I guess that's sort of one reading. Uh, the, the sort of psychological reading. So in the one one reading of it is he sort of he found this darkness and now he he killed Kurtz and he can leave. And then the other is he's so horrified by it that he has to destroy it. I, I can give context on that. So that second ending Halo. you described. So I'd like to do two things here. I, I'll, I'll address yeah. that context and also give more uh, context around the entire project and why we were interested in, in you looking at it. So that second, so he had filmed uh, Apocalypse Now famously in, in uh, the Philippines because the conditions were comparable to uh, Vietnam, obviously. Uh, uh, the the filming took place between, I think, 76 and 78. So the fall of Saigon was in 75. And uh, what was interesting is that in the 60s, the U.S. government that started the Vietnam War, so when they really started escalating troops into the country around the mid-60s, the U.S. government had actually even allowed uh, John Wayne to use U.S. military ships and bases for his theme, a film, The Green Beret. But by obviously the mid seventies, the tenure and emotion of Vietnam was much different. And the US government did not want to be involved in this film. And uh, so, uh, so uh, Coppola, who in 75, as we've talked about before, and while we're kind of shots, like he had come off one of the greatest runs in film history. He, he had made a uh, Godfather, the Godfather in 1972. Yeah. In 1974, he made the conversation and the Godfather too. Uh, and, and then prior to the Godfather, he wrote uh, actually the script for the movie Patton. So he was on just an incredible five year run, had all the cash in the world, all the all the financial, uh, political, and creative capital to make a film like Apocalypse Now. So the U.S. government wasn't going to help him make this film. Uh, they suspected that it was going to be anti-war. Uh, so he went to Ferdinand Marcus, the dictator of the Philippines, uh, but a U.S. ally. Uh, a lot of troops were stationed in the Philippines uh, during uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, I, I visited a couple of them. My, my wife's from the Philippines, so they're, they're all in Manila. they got these air bases. But basically, to your point about that second ending, so Ferdinand Marcus basically said, you got to blow up all these sets. So the blowing up of the set had to happen for logistical reasons. And he actually filmed the blowing of it, the blowing up of it, and then later said it actually wasn't meant to be an ending. So that kind of gives more ideas, like his initial ending that you talked about, whereas uh, they kind of use those out clips and maybe a bit of promotion. But but it is interesting because that has been a big controversy for three decades because it it spoke to how he thought about the film. And the, the other thing I will add about uh, just the making of it and before I pass over to Jim to opine on what Rob said was uh, so the making of Apocalypse Now is supposed to be uh, six weeks so what is that 100, 100 days what's six weeks I don't know. 42 days 42 days and it would be 236 and it would be 236 days uh, uh, Coppola yes. again he had all this financial and creative capital blew it literally blew it all to make Apocalypse Now. Had to mortgage his house halfway through the film, gave up a royalties on The Godfather to finance it. Um, there, Martin Sheen had a heart attack on set, almost died. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, Marlon Brando was paid a million dollars a week for three weeks, showed up grossly obese, never read The Heart of Dark. So he's the opposite of Rob, who not only watched the movie, yeah. watched the documentary, and then read the essay. Marlon Brando showed up never having read Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. It's like a 90-page book. And this guy couldn't <laughs> be bothered to show up. So he, he's the star of the world. And in, in the Heart of Darkness doc- documentary, this is an amazing scene, right? Where uh, where Coppola's losing his mind. He's like, all right, 
If Brando's not going to do it, I can call Pacino or Nicholson or Redford. I just love how he's just throwing out the most famous actors ever. He's like, I'll get one of them to do it. Uh, so he basically risked everything and his familial life. He brought his wife, uh, Eleanor, who filmed yeah. the footage for the documentary. So the lines that you had mentioned, Rob, where he's saying, like, this is going to be a failure, she had filmed that without his knowledge. Like, she filmed that for oh, yeah. diary purposes. So some of the uh, the, the audio that ended up in this documentary, which came out in 1991. So 12 years after the original film showed how he, how much he had put into it. But uh, well, I'll end with this before we can pass the baton around is uh, that the controversy at the time of the film's release was that at the Cannes Film Festival, he was able to finally finish this movie. It was one of the biggest running jokes in Hollywood. The The headlines were apocalypse when, right? Like instead of apocalypse now, I was like, is this yeah, film ever yeah. going to come out? He goes, so this is 1979. Uh, four years after the fall of Saigon, uh, after 60,000 people had died, Americans died in Vietnam, two to three million Cambodians, Vietnamese, and Laotians had died. And he goes, uh, uh, this movie isn't about Vietnam. This movie is Vietnam, <laughs> right? And then he's like, yeah, people yeah. are like, whoa, hold on a second. It's like, <laughs> we understand that the filming was difficult, but like, you, you're you you're comparing, you're, he was like, I am the God of this. Like, And he talks about it in the documentary, actually. He's like, when you were in his position, you do feel like Kurtz, right? He like, I, I am essentially the God of this project. And he's like, being a director of a film is one of the last places where you have full dictatorial powers. And so I guess Kurtz, yeah. that character is channeling a bit of him. But yeah, so I want to share that context and then ask Jim uh, if you had any thoughts on Rob's original thoughts on uh, the Heart of Darkness, Apocalypse Now connection. And, uh, and then I can pass it along from there. So absolutely, I do. Uh, first off, just some some notes that I find really interesting. You guys know that uh, Michael uh, Liberty on Twitter is my uh, head of internet media, and he has really great taste. And he offered me a TV series called The Offer, in which he said, like, no one has ever seen this. And so I watched it with my wife, and we loved it. And it's all about uh, them trying to get The Godfather made. And, and if you watch the thing, wh what the funniest sort of thing here is, to my, because Brando shows up fat, having not read the thing, yeah. and it was Coppola who re restored his career. Nobody wanted him for The Godfather. Like, the, the head of Paramount Studios, everyone was like, fuck no, that guy is a prima donna, we will not work with him. And all of the stuff that Coppola went through to get Brando as the Godfather, and so Brando thanks him by showing up, you know, fat, yeah. drunk, and, <laughs> and and having zero honorat, research, zero zero research. But you know, if you look at Brando's life, that it, you, he was really kind of just playing himself <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, in that particular role. And and that's the other interesting thing to me is that, you know, the whole into the darkness, that's Jung, right? You've got, you, you're the doctor of psychology here, Rob, so I will defer to you. But, um, you know, I, I recall a Jung quote, which is, that if you do not confront your own shadow, right, you, you will forever let things happen to you and call it fate. And so... Yeah. Obviously, a lot of this is about the captain confronting his own shadow, right? But I had a little different impression, and I haven't watched it recently. This is maybe good, because this is what I'm remembering, and we all know our memories are unreliable narrators. But I, for a brief minute when you were talking there, when, when he emerged after killing Kurtz, and they all bowed down to him, I briefly thought, oh my God, he's just gonna take Kurtz's place. Mm. Did you ever did you did you ever get oh, that? Yeah. Okay. I have the exact same thought of like, oh, so this is just a sort of a cycle where, <laughs> you know, the, the, the whoever can kill the leader becomes the leader. And it's yeah, it's I thought it was almost consistent with the way that it opened with Captain Willard. Um mm. yeah, just just sort of uh, uh experiencing this intense trauma and now he becomes the leader and this is sort of how he heals himself. But no, 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 yeah, yeah. It was I was actually a, yeah, a little surprised that he ended up leaving. But I guess, you know, that's that's in a way that's a happier it's a happier ending. If he had become the the sort of the new leader of this cult, that would have been a like a much darker ending, I think, if that's how but, it had concluded. But I agree. But also wouldn't that have been, in your opinion, 
a far more authentic ending because of what you've written about extensively, social hierarchies, uh, all of that type of stuff. I, you know, I was reading Howard Bloom's, uh, one of his books, um, in which he looks at that a lot, hierarchies and wh whatnot. I think I might have brought it up on our previous podcast, but okay. literally when one chimp challenges the alpha male and the alpha male goes down in defeat, the chimp who, and I, I sourced this because I didn't believe it when I read it the first time, the chimp who dis deposes him and becomes the alpha male, literally his posture changes. He stands far more straight and his balls descend. I was about to say, the dick must get bigger, right? Like, there's just something like a rush of testosterone to be. through the body. <laughs> it's phallic. <laughs> yeah. All right, Rob, you got to address yeah. this now, man. You've been yeah, writing yeah. a lot about dating and all. Like, let's hear the yeah, whole yeah. spiel. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, uh, I haven't seen... Yeah, well, that, that, that research makes sense to me. Um, but, but then when I think about... Um, you know, like, you know, in a way, Willard is following a different hierarchy, right? Like he so 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 Kurtz went rogue, right? Like he uh, he he um, strayed from the chain of command in the military. And then, um, you know, he sort of went his own way. Whereas with uh, with Captain Willard, he he adhered to it, right? So there's this sort of invisible hierarchy that we're not really seeing or we don't really see as much of. Whereas with, um, you know, with 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 Colonel Kurtz, right? Like we see the hierarchy. It's very direct. It's very immediate. It's very visceral. So I guess in a way, you know, like there's just sort of which hierarchies are you following? Um, and then I also, you know, I think that in a way that sort of journey into the interior and the confrontation of the shadow, like Willard didn't want to become the shadow. He just wanted to overcome his own shadow, right? Like I think there's sort of a different, like different, different interpretations there. Um, yeah, would it have been more honest? Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know if it would have been, it, it would have, I guess there's different kinds of honesty that would have been honest. Like, yeah, it could have been seen as an authentic ending in a certain sense. Um, you know, yeah, it's, it's funny though, like this, this idea of like, like, like sort of status and authenticity and higher. So, so one point on, on, um, on Marlon Brando and his weight, was that in the, the Heart of Darkness documentary when they talked about how they had to like film at certain angles and certain lighting? Yeah, uh, it's just always so that dark, they could right? Conceal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that they could conceal his uh, his face and his body, and yeah, that was really yeah, and uh, yeah, like like when I went back because I, I watched some of the clips again, I, I felt like like Kurtz's um, Ramon and Brando Kurtz's um, speech uh, that he he sort of describing what he saw when they tried to inoculate the children and how uh, the 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 Viet Cong the cadres cut off their arms, and, like that was such a like an that was like a very Nietzschean like very dark speech. Um, but I watched it again. And I'm like, yeah, you can kind of tell. Like, maybe he wasn't in the best physical shape of his life for that role. Um, but then in that in that documentary too, something else that I found interesting was that um, you know Bre uh, uh, Coppola was talking about how there were like a lot of young young college students and a lot of young people who wanted to join the film crew who wanted to like they were willing to go to Vietnam because originally they wanted to shoot it in Vietnam, right? Like they actually wanted to go to the war and film it as it was unfolding. Uh, and so there were a lot of young people who wanted to join and, and help. And I felt like this is so interesting because, you know, this is like the era of, of accusations of young people being draft dodgers and being cowards and not wanting to go fight in the war, but they were apparently many of them willing to go and, and, and work on a film crew, which is arguably more dangerous because you don't have a weapon. Uh, you know, you're actually perhaps even in more danger, uh, doing that. But my reading of that was that, um, if you're. Like at that point in American history, my my understanding was that, you know, to to join the military was actually like a very sort of dishonorable thing because this was like a bad war and the general sort of public sentiment, especially among the educated public, was like you shouldn't do this. This is awful, and so they weren't willing to 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 do that. But then when it comes to like filming this war or filming filming this this film that showed the um the sort of horrors of war, they were willing to to go into this danger zone in order to to capture that. And so it makes me wonder, like, were a lot of these young people, they weren't necessarily cowards in the sort of the physical sense. They weren't afraid of of dying. They were more afraid of sort of being uh, shunned by society, right? Like, if you, if you join the military, that's bad. But if you go and film this movie showing the horrors of war, that's good. So they were willing to put themselves in physical danger as long as the cause was justified. That was sort of my, my reading of that. 
Just uh, so for time like status element. Yeah, I just want to say timeline wise, just uh, uh, that was around because he originally wanted to do in sixty, the late sixties. So to your point, is like that was uh, it wasn't like when he was filming seventy six. The, the war was already over. Yeah, you nailed it. By, like, by that point, right? Sixty nine was at the, the the peak of like the protests and uh, and uh, people realizing that this was a true quagmire. And yeah, uh, yeah. no, that uh, that's a great point. I, I never and, again. I didn't think about that. That's awesome. <laughs> And yeah. and the other the other thing that I love about this film is that there are so it's a it's really a multifaceted lens, right? Because you see so many different versions of America in quotes, right? The the America as brutal killers, right? That's our guy who I love the smell of napalm in the morning. He knew Bill the war wasn't gonna touch him, <laughs> right? Like uh, you know, break it up over here so we can surf, right? That and and again, from a kind of a European point of view, they still kind of had that attitude that America was, you know, running around the world just breaking things and and you know doing it for superfluous or trivial reasons, i.e., surfing. But then there's also um, uh, Marlon Brando's character, uh, who is considerably of a different kind of America. And then finally, the scene where they. Uh, have the Playboy bunnies come in, and uh, you know uh, the. I I thought that scene was particularly effective because it underlined that you know the America in quotes empire wasn't an empire in any traditional sense like the British Empire or the empires that preceded it. It was literally an empire of the mind. It was an empire Cultural. of culture. Yeah. Right. And and in a way, yeah. I, I don't think a lot has changed in terms of the America as an empire of culture, or an empire of the mind. Soft you guys power. agree? Yeah. What do you guys think? Well, I just want I just want the listeners to uh, remind them that Jim said his favorite part of the movie was the Playboy Bunny. So just uh, let you know where his <laughs> mind is at. That's <laughs> like, oh, yeah. let me, uh, but you know what? Yeah. Part, let me let me talk about one. No. I uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what. Actually, one is, scene uh, very... to watch to prepare. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was actually the only scene that uh, that uh, that, that, that uh, us Jim watched. watched uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, Rob watched Rob watched three hours of like six hours of footage and like read all the Roger Ebert reviews and then Jim just watches that. No, I'll tell you what. Uh, what is kind of fortuitous uh, timing wise? Actually, is like I don't know if you guys follow the Ringers podcast, uh, the Big Picture. Uh, they're doing a podcast series right now called "Do We Get to Win This Time?" and they're basically looking at the entire history of Vietnam War uh, films. Uh, which is fascinating. So highly recommend uh, listening to that, which is just, it just happened to drop when we started the recording uh, all these months later. But something that's interesting, and in, uh, so the name, Do We Get to Win This Time, actually uh, is a Rambo line. So in uh, in First Blood, Rambo number two, uh, John Rambo, who's played by Sylvester Stallone, is a Vietnam vet. And in the film, he basically says, Do We Get to Win This Time, as in the Vietnam War. And uh, in the 80s, uh, Reagan uh, was president uh, uh, after Jimmy Carter. So he was president from 80 to 88. And Reagan long believed that Vietnam was a winnable war, but it was that the bureaucracy and the government didn't give the soldiers the chance. Or that's what he campaigned on, right? You know, kind of his macho image. And what's uh, uh, to your point, uh, Jim, about the soft power, what I want to bring up and why this podcast I mentioned is super interesting at this moment is so Viet Thanh Nguyen, who wrote the book, The Sympathizer, so I don't know if you guys remember that, he wrote the book, The Sympathizer, it won a Pulitzer, he's a Vietnamese-American professor, I think at uh, UC Davis. Um, but uh, the point of that book, and it is actually about the making of Apocalypse Now, it's like a fictional version of it. And he he's spoken widely, writes for the Times, has these opinion pieces, but he says something very interesting. He says that uh, uh, there's become a memory industry around the Vietnam War, as in he looks at wars in two parts. There's the war itself. And then there's, you know, the famous line from Churchill, the, the, the victors write the history. There's a writing of the history afterwards and how we remember it. And uh, uh, this isn't directly really to Jim's way. It's about the culture and the soft power. And you can actually trace the type of Vietnam movies that are made from the 60s to the 70s to the 80s. 80s, uh, uh, 80s is much more about the vets that came back. You know, you have films like Platoon, uh, Born on the Fourth of July, uh, Deer Hunter was in the late 70s. It came around the same time as Apocalypse Now, actually. And what's interesting about all these films is they're all from American directors. Uh, the Vietnamese people have almost no talking parts in any of these films. Then, they're seen as 
uh, the way that Viet Tinh Nguyen describes it, they're seen as just objects to be killed, raped, or uh, uh, shuttled aside. And um, so it does speak to the saw power that Jim is alluding to, though, right? Like even just the creation of all these films is just like it's it's just told from the American perspective. And you know, I, I've been asked about this a lot because you know I, I film making ambitions, and uh, I love I, I I think these are great pieces of art. And there's always this this, but there's always this other side of it is like you know how do I feel that there's almost zero Vietnamese representation. I, I'll be very honest with you. It's like, I never, I never even thought about that until I guess these culture wars in the last couple of years. And I think part of it has to do with the fact that my family has quite a quote unquote revolutionary history in Vietnam. My great grandfather was the anti-French nationalist, one of the most revered writers. So like in my, in my household, there was never this question, Oh, Vietnam's getting rid of the history because we were like, Oh no, no, I have a history. I know what it is. But I think for a lot of, Vietnamese, overseas Vietnamese, uh, especially the refugees that maybe didn't have the same heritage. And, you know, this is the depiction of your culture. And, uh, you know, it does speak to the soft powers. Like, you, it's being completely narrated and dictated by the U.S. Uh, uh, cultural uh, apparatus, even if some of the films are quite anti-war. Because Apocalypse Now is quote-unquote anti-war. But you're watching yeah. it, and you're just kind of like... There's zero Vietnamese. Literally, the only Vietnamese speaking part is when they massacre about the Vietnamese people, and yeah. you know what I mean. It's like so there is that part of it, and I, I I think that just is to address Jim's point specifically about the soft power. There's like layers to it. Not only does the yeah. film depict soft power, but even just the entire uh, complex of these films just speaks to the soft power. They dictate everything around the Vietnam War, even See, on the yeah. negative. Side. Just jumping in there because I am of that era, right? So I saw that as a teenager. I grew up in that time. I actually went to a school that was a military school, and uh, like the everyone loved the noncoms and everyone hated the colonel of the students, right? And that attitude was incredibly pers- pervasive in a, in a military now, much more of a prep school with military, but still. And and my reaction from to those scenes was different than yours, uh, because mine was it was depicting Americans as so fucking brutal that they treat these human beings like just like animals. They they yeah. they don't inquire, they just like machine gun them all to death. And I I so it's really interesting hearing your perspective as well. No, I think your time is the, is probably the more uh, uh, accurate assessment in the sense of like, even though uh, it's supposed to be, I don't know, but it is perceived, it is actually perceived the way it was meant, right? It was an anti-war film. And, and I guess for your segment, there's a, there's certainly there was another segment being like, you know, the pom-poms are out or they're like, oh, you know, we're winning. That's how they're reviewing those scenes. But uh, I, it is, you know, quite nice to hear that from where you grew up and your experience of it was like, oh, no, these the, the, these individuals are savages. Yeah. It's interesting. Rob? So so I was reading I was reading some um, I think it was on Reddit or one of these message boards of people's sort of reactions to this movie, just sort of collecting different opinions and, and sort of seeing how people watch this. Some of the some of the posts reminded me of our last conversation of how you can watch a show like The Sopranos at, at different points in your life and come away with sort of different readings of it. How, you know, if you're very young, you watch The Sopranos and you think it's this, you know, Tony Soprano's a badass and it's so cool to be, you know, this Italian gangster. And then you watch it later and you're like, oh, there are layers to this. And it's actually uh, uh, a condemnation of that lifestyle and the, the, the sort of the, the detrimental effects of the criminal life and all that. And so, you know, I'm, I'm reading these, these Reddit posts and, you know, someone said, you know, when I was when I was a kid, I was a teenager and I watched this movie and I'm like, man, how cool would it be to be Colonel Kurtz? Like, you know, to be like, you know, like the king of the savages to just like do whatever you want, kill whoever you want, just like be this badass monster. And he's like, and then I watched it later as an adult and I'm like, oh, this is horrifying. Like every part of this movie is just like, uh, um, you know, it's a basically like a, a very strong and powerful anti-war film. But there is that there, there's some kind of a, I read this there's this law or something of like a, like if you, if you make a movie that condemns something if you make it too cool you actually have like this backfire effect oh it's like Wall you know, Street like movie, right Wall Street exactly. or the social network like Wall yeah. Street's supposed to be Ex- anti finance 
But Gordon yeah, Gecko right. is like the coolest guy in the world. <laughs> or exactly. the Wolf of Wall Street, right? The more recent the DiCaprio. Wall Street, yeah. yeah. Dude, I know Thanks. guys who work in... I, I know guys right now in their 20s who, who <laughs> work there because of the Wolf of Wall Street. Like, <laughs> that's why they're in a play. That's not, that was not the message of the movie. It's like... Well, you know what? Like, Kilgore's it. character is actually... So, like, Jim mentioned is like... Because he basically took out this entire village. The famous uh, 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 the smell of napalm in the morning smells like victory. It's like because he wanted to surf, Great. right? And there's a there's a line that I'm allowed to say because I'm Vietnamese. He says, Charlie, don't surf. So, Charlie Great. was the... Uh, the 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 slur to Vietnamese because oh, yeah. the call sign was Victor Charlie VC so they called yeah. him Charlies and um, but there's actually a scene there that at, exactly to your point Rob uh, even I watched the original I'm like oh man this Kilgore guy is like next level he's like yeah. he wants to surf so bad that he's ordering like all the resources of the military to take out the surf but there's a, like a line there that I watched like when I was much older he has a he has this it's a chilling line he's like right after napalm line he just goes. One day this war is going to be over, and then just walks away. It just yeah. like, hey, right? yeah. like yeah. he just looks at his chief like one day this war is going to be over. That's it, and he just walks away. Yeah. And you can tell that he's choked that it's going to be over. And then I didn't realize yeah. that until like twenty years later. I'm like, okay, this guy is like totally a savage human being. I think that war makes everyone savage. I think that's a larger lesson. I'd actually love to ask you guys about this. I know Rob that you've spoken with uh, Jordan Peterson before, but. He always, uh, he regularly quotes uh, uh, Solzhenitsyn, right? He's like the, yeah. the line between good and evil runs between every human. And I think that's the point. I think that was actually one of the larger takeaways of Apocalypse Now is like, you put anyone in these conditions, like they are capable of what Lawrence Fishburne, who's 15 years old yeah. when he did this movie, massacring yeah. that ship of Vietnamese or or Willard, yeah. who's supposed to be cut and dry, got his tie on, but, you know, take out with extreme prejudice. And he he's able yeah. to get himself to that. And and actually, just to uh, continue with that, uh, Jed McKenna wrote like an incredibly chilling passage in one of his books where he is invited to this dinner party of, you know, uh, spiritually enlightened people who he, he okay. looks at as total fakes, right? And, and they are trying to like poke the bear uh, with Jed. And literally what he does is he... He narrates the end of civilization for them. And he goes, how quickly are you going to love that little, you know, wonderful wine that you're sniffing right now when the electricity goes out and your neighbors are no longer your neighbors. They're savages coming into your house for the food and, you know, for your resources. And like, it's, it's like yeah. wild. And it, and when you hearing you say that trunk, like that's the underlying theme here too, right? The 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 veneer of civilized society is much thinner than many people maybe think it is. What do Tim you Burns think? had that line, right? Tim Burns did the Vietnam documentary in uh, ni- 2017. Do you guys ever watch that? The ten part yeah. Vietnam. The Vietnam. Yeah. War- so I actually watched that with my parents. They they couldn't watch it. So that's how good okay. it is in the sense of like how true to form it was. Uh, but he actually, that line frequently came up in that documentary is like, there is just a tiny veneer of civilization that as soon as a, a real conflict happens, or as soon as the, uh, you know, the rubber hits the road, it just instantly goes away. Right. And, it, and this is always my, like, personally, just my personal kind of growing up stories. Like, and I, I know Rob's had a very challenged uh, upbringing and went through many things. Like, this is when I look at, uh, you know, the, a lot of these culture wars is completely useless as in imagine being in that situation, right? It's like, you don't, you know, you're not thinking about what someone's pronouns are. Right? You're just like, you're just trying to survive. Oh. Right. It's like that mentality has just been completely lost as we, as we move up a Haslow's, uh, a Maslow's hierarchy and just have everything taken care of for us. But like in the guts of Please. it, in uh, when, when there's this darkness and this, the veneer of civilization is tiny is like the reality of what really matters comes up. Rob, yeah. what do you I think? I think we had a taste. Yeah, well, we had a taste of that, I thought, in early 2020. Like, before we knew what COVID was and how it was going to unfold, I think there was that period of, like, that's all people talked about was, like, what are we going to do during this pandemic? Um, and, yeah, like, all of the, the culture wars and all of the, you know, these kind of silly conflicts were put on pause for a while. Um, and that was, like, really interesting to see that play out in real time from, yeah, say, February to February to maybe April. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that you know, the that, that um, Solzhenitsyn quote about the the line of good and evil and uh, yeah thinking about like the the way that this movie de- depicted the horrors of war yeah there's there's some really interesting research um 
on this uh, this idea of moral injury. Uh, and so moral injury is basically uh, this what what happens when people uh, violate their own conscience, essentially. And you know, different psychologists uh, and different researchers have have described this. You know, a lot of the a lot of their patients and a lot of the people that they see uh, who are suffering from PTSD, it's not necessarily um, something that happened to them that that triggered this, but it's something that they did that they sort of acted out of their their own conception of their moral character. Maybe you know they massacred some innocent people or or killed some civilians, whether intentional or otherwise, and they didn't realize that that was within them that they were capable of this, and this actually triggers something. So this is an interesting sort of uh, perspective on human psychology too. That often what 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 triggers trauma is like, oh, I didn't know that I could do something like that. Um, and I think like you know it's it's not really clear exactly what was going on with Willard at the beginning of the movie uh, when he's in his underwear and he's punching the walls and he's losing his mind and he's drinking. And, you know, one possibility is like he maybe had committed some, you know, atrocities and he was sort of working through it in, in, in that way. And he wasn't able to sort of overcome it until he sort of killed a greater monster than himself. Right. Like once he meets Kurtz and Kurtz had probably committed many. Well, you can kind of see the atrocities, right? Like when he's when he's in the ship and he goes up to, to the that um, that settlement, you can see like like bodies hanging in the trees and like severed heads floating in the in, in the river. And it's like this is this is like hell on earth, essentially. And so he enters, you know, basically hell and, and kills kills the you know, kills the leader of this. And, you know, it, 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 this is sort of another maybe psychological reading is sort of overcoming the, his own moral injuries by killing a, a greater monster than himself. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the, that whole like concept of moral injury, I remember being very fascinated about it uh, a few years ago. Um, and I think this sort of this captures that sort of idea of, of that veneer of morals uh, of civilization too. that, you know, it's not just what could happen to you or what could happen to your family, but also like who you'll become in that situation that often surprises and shocks people as well. You, you know, one of the things I, I would uh, often ask, like, could you ever be a pacifist? Right. And yeah. and back then, uh, my answer is pretty much similar to what it is today, which is I don't think so, because like if someone was came into my home and threatened when I was answering and I was still living with my parents. So the answer was like, if somebody came into my home armed and threatened my parents, like I'm going to kill them. And there, and I said, so I, I don't know how that squares with this idea of pacifism, but, and then I would turn the question around. I'd say, would you just let them kill your parents? And yeah. like the answer almost always from people who were, for, you know, professing that they were pacifists all the way through was like, yeah, no, I guess maybe I'm not a pacifist. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh so, so I have a, a story about this actually. So a friend of mine, um, and I can talk about this was, this was in the media here in, in the UK a few years ago. So a good friend of mine here, um, he's from like a pretty, pretty well-to-do family and so basically, so he has two sisters. So he's, you know, young guy. He was at this point, he was still, I think, in college and he was visiting his parents. They were in their very nice house uh, on the on the outskirts uh, uh, here in around Cambridge, UK, London area. And uh, there was a there was a, a, a ring at the door and, you know, it's a, it's a gated area. So, you know, the, the, the his father uh, checked the camera and saw a police car and, uh, you know, it was a bit, a bit unexpected. But, he, you know, he said, what's going on? And the police officer uh, said, you know, hey, we've been hearing some calls, uh, some suspicious activity in the area, and we just need to come in and, and, and ask you a few questions. And so, you know, naturally, you know, it's a police car. The, the, his father lets these these guys in, and as soon as he opens the door, uh, the door is kicked in, and it's I think four guys, like four, you know, two really big guys, you know, basically four dudes, really big. You know, one guy has a sawed off shotgun, puts it right in his face, and he's like, you know, take me to your safe. We want all your valuables. And his wife. Uh, is you know behind him and screams and she's running up the stairs. One of these guys starts chasing her, um, and his so my friend he's he's upstairs studying. He has no idea any of this is going on. They live in a big house. He's not hearing this the commotion. And his two sisters are in the home gym, and you know they got the the music blaring, so they have no idea what is happening. This is almost like a movie, right? Like this is like you know all this stuff going on. And so you know the, his his dad, you know he takes him you know down downstairs and takes him to the safe. And the mom is like running, like frantically running upstairs. And then she manages to hit um, a panic button uh, that they have in their master bedroom. And as soon as this goes off, you know, this, the guys get spooked and, and immediately uh, go away. 
And basically what happened is they they somehow stole uh, a police car and then just like bought some uniforms online and managed to essentially sort of impersonate police officers. And they were just going to rob these people and who knows what else. And uh, so, so I'm talking to them after, and it's funny, like they're kind of, you know, they, I don't know if they're, they're pacifists, but I think this, like this whole situation radicalized them <laughs> and they were like, but you know, when I spoke to them, when they told me this story last year, they're like, we're going to get a gun. Like, there is no question. Like we are going to like arm this place to the teeth. We're going to get a gun and all this. So yeah, it was, um, yeah, like this is, you know, as soon as you sort of have contact with like that part of reality. Um, I think like any, any, uh, notions of pacifism go out the window, like once your family's lives are in danger, right? Yeah. And you know, it, it, as you were speaking, it reminds me of the movie, A Clockwork Orange, right? Yeah. Where, you know, a bit of the old ultra violence and that was coming for, for context, you guys, like, so the sixties in America, at least, but worldwide really, uh, were such a massive departure from the world before, right? Okay. I, I'm fascinated by listening to music from the 50s and comparing it to the 60s <laughs> because literally it's like in, in, in almost different centuries. And, and so this came on so quickly and a lot of the stuff that we're seeing now, say, for example, in San Francisco and parts of uh, the Seattle area, Portland, where uh, people kind of felt they made a bargain, right? The bargain is I'll pay my taxes. I'll be a good citizen. Now you got to protect me, right? And, and a lot of these movies, the war, even Apocalypse Now, all kind of made the same period, was kind of a collective breakdown of the social contract that people felt. They're like, I mean, what the fuck? You know, why are you letting all of this violence run amok? And, you know, the movies seem to come online to really underline that point. Am I being too dramatic, Rob? Hmm. Oh, I don't I don't think it's it's necessarily too. I mean, that's like one of the the uh, uses or sort of uh, benefits, I think, of art is a sort of captures parts of life that you wouldn't necessarily be exposed to. And so you can see, like, you know, that's that's part of what what uh, Apocalypse Now is about, right? The horror, horrors of war. A lot of people can romanticize it if they don't know what it is. And sort of when you see it play out in front of you and suddenly you realize, like, oh, this is, you know, this isn't some um, it's not a fantasy or a video game or something uh, to, to be excited about. And it it can either attract monsters, you know, so, so it's sort of out of clear because you don't get much backstory on Kilgore. You get a bit of backstory on Colonel Kurtz. Um, but it's unclear if they started out as monsters or if war made them into monsters, but either way, right? Like war is not, uh, uh, something to just sort of glorify. Um, so, so yeah, I think like that, that, that like uh, wars are like uh, the, the depictions of war in movies, they're almost sort of inherently, uh, like a commentary on, on the, the sort of the brutality of human nature. Do you, uh, yeah. no, I was just going to ask Rob and uh, you, Jim, like were the other films of this ilk that you thought demonstrated uh, the brutalities of war or, you know, the movie like Patton, which is, has a yeah. legendary opening line, which lionizes war, right? It's like, we're, you know, uh, uh, what was the line he has there is like, um, no one's ever won a war dying. Like you win a war by killing the other son of a bitch. Right. Like, yeah. No, uh, no, no, no. The line is basically, uh, don't they, die for your country. <laughs> don't, don't die for your country. Make the other poor fucking dumb bastard die on his hill. For his right. country, right. <laughs> so yeah. that that much more, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm going to call romanticized, but it's not a negative. You know, or do you guys have any other ones that kind of when you watch it, like, oh, that's uh, that's not good. Yeah, Rob, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I'm thinking about like, I mean, just my own experiences. So I was never, I deployed, but I was, you know, I was in the Air Force. You know, like the, you know, one of the jokes that that would be because I, I worked as a technician. That the joke was like, you know, if, if the technicians are fighting on the front lines, then we've already lost. <laughs> and, uh, and so I didn't see, I didn't Funny. see any, like, I didn't see any combat. But what I did see was, uh, when I was stationed, um, in, in al uh, in, in Qatar. So that was like a sort of a way station on the way to the U S or the UK from Afghanistan and Iraq. And so I would see the caskets like draped in American flags on the way from, uh, Baghdad or on their way back from Kandahar. And, uh, and so I would see that. And then on occasion, you know, we'd have like these medivac, you know, these helicopters, these airplanes, uh, sort of emergency 
um, uh, vessels where you would see, uh, you know, young guys with their limbs blown off or, um, you know, under like severe sort of medical injuries. And so, yeah, I mean, to, to see something like that up close, it's like, you know, it's sort of a reminder that like, you know, it's war is not like, yeah, it's, it, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be romanticized. Right. And yeah, as far as like, yeah, war movies, I think they have like, they, they sort of have to walk that tightrope between sort of being entertaining enough to get an audience and not so grim that people walk away feeling completely bummed out. Um, but yeah, like, I, I don't know of any other, um, the, oh, well, well, Full Metal Jacket, right? I think everyone remembers the, the boot camp scenes of Full Metal Jacket, yeah, but actually the, sure. the second half of that movie is pretty brutal as well. Um, yeah. What do you think, Jim? Uh, I, 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 the, the movie that sprung to mind, which was kind of a, a crossover in, in parts of it did in fact make people glorify war in quotes, but also showed the, the nastiness and, and horror of it would be saving private Ryan. Yes. Uh, yeah. that opening scene in saving private Ryan, is like, to my mind, still one of like the most brutally honest uh this is what it was actually like you know i i grew up uh my my father was of that generation in world war ii and unlike in vietnam uh he did everything he could to enlist and he had some health problems that were minor but they excluded him he was 4f and my grandfather was a very prominent successful business guy who happened to like know the president. And so he literally asked FDR whether she would let my father into the military because my father felt like a failure, right? Like I'm all, all of my friends are there. And, and yet he, he they never let him in uh, because FDR said, if we take him, he's ours for life. And like, no, we're not, we're not going to do this kind of particular favor. But as a kid, my dad's friends who did serve used to come over for dinner and I would just like sit there transfixed at the stories. I remember John O'Keefe was on the Bataan death march and literally like whenever my mom said the O'Keefe's are coming for dinner, I, I kind of weirdly was like, oh, okay. Because like these were firsthand stories that just made you yeah. shudder, and and yet I also think, you know, with all the people like video games so violent that's going to make people violent. I d I don't really concur with that because if you've ever seen an actual human being killed in real life, the difference is profound. I remember the first time I ever saw a real human being killed in real life. I was at Georgetown and I was watching, I, it was uh, the El Salvador Civil War or the Nicaragua Civil War. And th this was shot live on TV news. They took the reporter, put him on the ground and shot him in the head. Whoa. And they filmed it and I almost threw up watching okay. this. Like my entire body just was like, I, I literally felt myself heaving and like, couldn't believe what I had just seen. And, and so that was when I thought, man, we do know the difference between real violence and pretend and, and make believe violence. And yet like apocalypse now, if it doesn't make you think, man, we should do our very, yeah. very best to not do this Although, in the future didn't they, um in, in apocalypse now they did kill that uh that cow right they killed they, they did they, killed, they slaughtered a bunch of animals right weren't there yeah. some like animal rights violations or something in this movie oh, they, yeah, totally they talked about I, it. No, but that they was a, that was the tribe right that's a, something the tribe itself did right i think that was in a documentary exactly no a that's right that was the their, tribe their do. Like, oh that's a good uh that's a good thing uh, we should add to the film <laughs> Yeah, yeah, nice loophole exactly. if, if the tribe yeah. does it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I but but Rob, I think I think Trump's right. I think they were yeah. doing it. The indigenous people that he was filming for the thing, they were actually doing it. And okay. he's like, let's let's get that on film. Yeah. I think. Oh, I, I see. could be I could be corrected there. Well, I was just gonna say they starved that tiger too, didn't they? They they starved the tiger for a few days for that scene where they're in the where in the, they're yes. in the jungle and they have the because you know, they wanted him to be extra aggressive, extra vicious. Which and yeah. so they they kept the tiger in a cage, no food, 
just so that they could get that. Peter could have ended this just, film like he could have saved uh, a couple of like, two hundred days of filming, just like this is not going to happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but let's get back to like uh, the the connection between um, what happened to Coppola himself, right? And and that's where Jed McKenna's piece becomes, I think, really relevant. Uh, okay. Because I when, I remember the first time that I read that uh, Jed piece, and I was like, wow. Okay, so it it completely changed my frame of reference for the movie itself, which I had really liked, um, uh, you know, and it got its job done. It was like, holy shit, the horrors of war. Uh, but but then when McKenna wrote uh, that extensive piece on it, and w- one of the things he says in that piece is kind of like, be careful what you wish for. Because if you're sincere, the universe is going to turn you into the tool that can accomplish that goal. And Rob, riff a little yeah. bit on 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 that. Could you give? A, I, so I haven't read this essay yet. So Rob, could you also give a bit of context for uh, what what yeah. the essay is about? Yeah. Well. So so well. I, I think Jim could maybe describe more about Jed McKenna's background, but the essay itself. Yeah, it's uh, it's it sort of descri- describes um, Coppola's journey. It's almost uh, a commentary on Heart of Darkness and Apocalypse Now in itself, and how, yeah, essentially, in order to make that that uh, the movie, uh, Coppola had to sort of fashion himself into the conduit through which that movie could be made. And I mean, there's some there's some interesting sort of union or mis- mi- sort of union elements to it, mystical elements to it that. It's a sort of commentary on the creative process overall. It almost reminds me a bit of like Stephen Pressfield in The War of Art, where mm-hmm. you are not actually making this product. You are just the the vessel through which the creative energies of the world are uh, have chosen you to to produce this thing. And so for Coppola, you know, there's there was a great, um, you know, there was a great. I, I saved one of the quotes here where yeah, he bit off more than he could chew with this project. So the universe reforged him into a tool that could do the job. And then another great quote, shooting a movie about the descent into madness became became itself a descent into madness and how there are the, sort of these parallels between the movie itself and then the making of the movie. Um, and so my my sort of takeaway from from that essay was that uh, you, know, you have to you have to be. So, so one of the things that, that McKenna says in this this uh, this essay, which you know, I, I don't think I necessarily agree with, was that uh, Coppola is a great artist, but Godfather one and two are, you know, like they, they don't hold the candle to Apocalypse Now. Like they don't even come close to the artistic achievement of Apocalypse Now, uh, which I think for a lot of people would would be upsetting to them because Godfather 1 and 2 are like, those are the movies that uh, of Coppola's that people remember. But McKenna says, you know, those two movies, you know, those did not prepare him for the greatness of Apocalypse Now. You have to be a great artist to make this movie. Coppola wasn't actually a great artist when he started the project, but in the process of trying to make the film, he fulfilled the steps required for greatness and through that process became the artist that could make such a film. Uh, and so, yeah, I thought that was a, a really interesting essay oh, because like as a, <laughs> as a, yeah, well, as a writer, I think like, and, and I know you both write, like, yeah, I think you can sort of connect with that in a way because at least for me, I, I never learned my lesson where I, I don't, I don't often, I don't like the discipline part, part of writing <laughs> We're like, okay, I got to write, I got to sit down and I got to write something. And like, I dread that every time. But then once I sit down and I'm in that flow state, I don't know where that's coming from. And maybe you two can sort of vibe with this or connect with it where you have an idea and you don't really, it's sort of messy in your mind and you sit down and suddenly these ideas come out and you're sort of coming, making these connections and you're like, where's all this coming from? You don't really know. And I think that's the kind of energy that, that Jed McKenna is, is, is uh, alluding to here. But uh, Jim, could you talk talk about like who who is Jed McKenna? Who like what is his um, so, background? Yeah, yeah, I can easily. Uh, but first, I I'm reminded of the Dorothy Parker who was the Algonquin Roundtable wit, um, and she had a great quote, which is, "I hate writing. I love having written." <laughs> that's a that's a good that's a good line. And and and, and I always kind of use that as my mantra uh, because like I hate writing. But I do love having written. Yeah, uh, right. Now, as far as Jed McKinnon, so I got Jed killed by a good friend of mine, Dan Jeffries, who's a AI tech guy, brilliant systems architect, et cetera. And he he wrote a an article in, for I think Hacker, whatever news, 
and it was uh, it was called Rick and Morty Explain the Universe, and it was literally not about Rick and Morty at all. He did use them as examples, but it was all about he had discovered Jed McKenna, right? And and so I was intrigued enough to buy all of Jed's books and and start reading them, and he intrigued me for a couple of reasons. First off, he is the opposite, even though he's in the spiritual section of, of your bookstore. He is kind of like the, the anti-spiritual guy. He, he maintains that uh, most of the so-called gurus and whatnot who say, oh, you know, enlightenment is love and, and all of these things. He thinks they're totally full of shit and, and that, uh, that they really are instruments of Maya, the goddess of illusion, right, to, to keep you soundly asleep. Right. And and so he, he advocates a uh, position of uh, atoliosis, which is basically eating yourself. And, and he says, you got to do that with writing. So you got to write down, who am I? What, you know, why am I here? What can I prove? And, and essentially, he, he, he's brutal on most of the things people think about as spiritual uh, ism and and. Yet he holds out this candle that, look, we're all the dream state together, so it ties in really close to the Matrix, that kind of thing, uh, the, or Plato and the allegory of the cave, because they're the same story. Matrix is more fun to watch, but same deal. Um, okay. and, and, and essentially, the reason I get intrigued with him is because it, a lot of what he writes really resonates with me about my own thoughts and, and whatnot. Like, uh, I've been reading the Tao Te Ching since I was 18 years old. And I, I joked a few years ago, you know, now I'm 50, whatever, when I was making the joke. And I think I'm finally beginning to understand what it means. And, and so he, he, the thing I love about Jed is he's incredibly funny. He's erudite, like his, he is extremely well-read. Yeah, if you read uh, his piece on uh, Melville's Moby Dick, you, you you're gonna not be able to see that book in the same light ever ever again. Um, and I don't know, it was one of those. I actually reread it after reading the Jed essay, and I got to tell you, like it it was it read as a completely different book after reading yeah. uh, Jed's take on it, right? And I had to read it in high school and. I was like everyone else. I got the clip notes and, you know, yeah, this is a very important book and like, oh, so boring, but it's, it's like really not. So the, the final takeaway about Jed is that he, he seems like the real deal to me because where is he, right? His, his following is big enough so that he could be making bank. He could be making so much money on spiritual courses, on YouTube channels, on a sub stack, on all of these ways and monetizing this. And he doesn't do it. Where is he? Yeah, he, he? Who knows? There's all sorts of theories about him. But I think that's a joke on his part. I, I <laughs> you know, the, the joke on his part is you guys are looking at the finger, not the moon at which it is pointing at. He would, in my yeah. opinion, be the first to say, who gives a fuck who the hell I am as a person, right? It's yeah. like when, 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 when people, uh, Lao Tzu, the supposed author of the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu, if you dig into it, it actually means, it's an honorific, it means old master, right? And my guess is the Tao Te Ching was written over centuries by many, yeah. many people. And then, and then they attribute it all to this Lao Tzu character, right? And, okay. and there was a brief period where like, uh, people who knew I was into Jed, they're like, would you be willing to go in on a private eye to find out who this guy really is? And I'm like, you're missing the point. And, and that's, I, I took briefly to calling him my favorite fictional character who tells you okay. that you're a fictional character. Because essentially... Okay. His his gig is is uh you know not not two but one uh hey. that that all, all of the universe is one thing 
and and we're yeah. all I, I'm you, Tron. I'm I'm Rob. We're all each other, uh, and and it it fits very much with a lot of the um, the thinking in the Bhagavad Gita and the Tao Te Ching and other areas. So in that respect, he's he's I wouldn't call him mainstream, uh, yeah. but but he's he's fun to read because it's not you don't like feel like little oh, cringe like. After yeah. reading him, and 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 he seems to be brutally honest about a lot of things. Even though he he, here's what I love about it: he'll he'll start a book saying, "I am about to lie to you," <laughs> and, then, and then he'll he'll do the thing. And you'll think, "Wow, that doesn't sound like a lie." But yeah. he's, I, let me do the disclaimer here. He is the first step is a doozy with Jed. You, you you like you don't want to read Jed if you don't like if if you wouldn't like be willingly slapped by the Zen master with the stick right endlessly. Um, Jed might might play with your head a little. Like if you if you were a newbie to films and someone's like, hey man, do you have a recommendation for like a jungle film? I'm like yeah yeah yeah, just go to the fast forward to the end of Apocalypse Now and then like watch the last <laughs> twenty minutes, man. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you want to get eased into it, right? Um, what about, well, is there is Jed Satoshi Nakamoto? Yeah. Is it is that is that in the cards? <laughs> same guy. Uh yeah, same guy. Yeah. Same guy. Yeah. No, and I'm definitely say, buying that yeah. book. Jed Talks. Yeah. Well, Rob, so, so I got number say? two. I, I was gonna say, so this is Jed Talks two. So this for me, the this essay about um Apocalypse Now and Heart of Darkness from from Jed McKenna, <laughs> I think for me it was a good it was a good entry point uh for, from Jim. But it was a sort of a good bridge into Jed McKenna's work because you know, when I, when, when you, I, cause I've heard you, Jim, on your podcast and other, other, uh, uh, avenues you've discussed his work. And I, I looked him up once and I'm like, this guy seems like, you know, some spiritual claptrap <laughs> nonsense. Like, you know, I'm a, because, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a serious, you know, I'm a serious social scientist. I don't need to be reading this. This not, and this was like, I don't know, this was probably like a year and a half ago when I first heard you talk about it. And then it's interesting, like since then, this is sort of my, you know, shifting perspective where and, and it almost sort of mirrors a bit like a reversal of, of what happened in psychology overall, where psychology sort of started with it sort of started out as a branch of philosophy. And then, you know, it sort of went, you know, this is a very potted history of sort of Freud and Jung and Alfred Adler and all these guys. And then in the mid 20th century, you know, sorry, psychology wanted to suddenly become taken seriously as a real science. And then there was this shift toward behaviorism and, you know, now we want statistics and we want standard deviation. We want, you know, we want all these things to like prove that we're an actual science and we want experimental methods and control groups and randomized trials. And so, you know, then that's, the, that's the kind of psychology that, that is, you know, pervasive in academia now is like, you have to be pretty well versed in statistics, especially like post-replication crisis, all this stuff, like psychology became very sort of, you know, very sort of into, it turned into more and more into a scientific field. And then once I received my PhD last year and, and you know, I read Jed McKenna and now I'm reading, like I'm reading Jung, I'm reading Freud, like I'm reading all these guys that no one ever reads in psychology anymore. Like if you, if you mention Freud to a psychologist today, like in, unless there's some kind of like old school psychoanalyst, if you talk to like a psychology professor, they would say like, no one, like, no one talks about Freud anymore. Like it's kind of an embarrassment <laughs> in modern psychology. Um, but I'm reading it now, you know, after reading McKenna and reading these guys, and I'm like, yeah, there's something, there's something to this. I know it's not science. I know it's not you know, they, they didn't carry out a study. This isn't like peer reviewed research, but they're, they're tapping into something else, right? That's it's sort of a deeper spiritual philosophical. It's something else beyond the sort of empirical that I think they're getting at. But that's sort of what I got from this, this essay too. And then I just want to, the, 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 I found the quote, uh, from Jed McKenna on, on Godfather, where he calls it thematically banal, little more than an overproduced soap opera. And then, you know, both of the movies says, sure, they're great movies, but they're, they're not about anything. And don't deserve to be considered alongside films like Apocalypse Now. <laughs> They're not about anything. Like that is that you know, tough critic, right? You said a tough critic earlier, Trump. That's like that is very tough critic. And then uh, on on the creative process, which I, I sort of alluded to earlier, where he says, the quote is, uh, "I I may see what goes into the black box, and I may see what comes out of the black box, but I have no idea what's going on inside the black box." I think like that's a nice sort of uh, uh, summary of like sort of his at least in this essay maybe he has other thoughts and other but in that essay that's sort of my understanding of his view of the creative process is like there's something else that takes hold of you when you're writing when you're trying to be a good artist 
And uh, yeah, so overall, like that was a good for me, like a good starting point for for McKenna stuff. He, yeah, he's he's uh, the black box is really interesting to me because I actually took a lot out of that. I I had kind of independently because uh, I read a lot about like uh, Tesla, the, the man, um, and like he was way out there, man. <laughs> if you if you read about his life um, and. Uh, the things he believed and and whatnot. He, one of the things that really took me with him that McKenna makes a big point of is that at best we are co-creators. And of course, this has antecedents yeah. in in Greek and Roman mythology. The muses, right? A muse is someone is what they're really talking about. And and so if you open up yourself to the idea that, hey, maybe I'm just the co-creator here. Maybe, maybe I'm going to just leave myself open to like these ideas. I love to experiment on myself, right? And so whenever I started something with that as my beginning line, I am totally open. I'm only the co-creator here. This isn't mine. This isn't me thinking this up. I got to tell you, the ideas are a lot better. And- yeah. And I don't know it, I because I always hesitate to talk about it because it sounds so fucking woo woo, but yeah. like I I I think that it would be great if we could have a scientific method that could actually test this, that could replicate, and you know do all that yeah. kind of stuff. But absent that, you know, d- don't worry too much about meaning. Look for use. I think that's Wittgenstein. Uh, but yeah. that's a great quote. That you know, yeah. don't don't forever be worried about meaning is it useful and right yeah. that's henry james and uh not henry william james uh or yeah. no it is it which which james yeah. is that rob yeah i don't know yeah i don't know that one i don't know that quote um yeah one thing i wanted to ask since we're talking about creativity and this jed mckenna essay and i mentioned stephen pressfield earlier is like because I, I know i know you both write and you both uh you know you 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 yeah, jim i know you podcasting and sort of all these creative domains but like how do you like do you have a routine like how do you so so, so one thing that i liked in the war of art I, I read that book a couple of years ago in preparation when i was trying to write my book and one of the things that he says in that book is um and i you know this was like you know it's such a simple idea but it was really helpful for me is like you're you don't have to wait for the muse your job is to like get your ass in the seat and 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 you have to find the muse yourself right like you have to open up the blank document and just get to work and, you know, if you if you do the steps correctly, if you show up every day, eventually the muse will appear like, OK, so that's how you have to do. You can't just like, oh, well, I feel like writing now. If you try to do that, you'll never actually write because at least for me, I never actually I seldom feel like writing. Uh, but like for both of you, how do you do you have like an approach for this? Do you just go through that sort of mechanistically of, you know, this time during this day, I'm going to write, I'm going to podcast, I'm going to record. How do you guys think about it? Drong, how, how do you, how do you do it? I just want to say like everything that you've said over the past 20 minutes can 100% echoes like my experience, uh, particularly when you said, when I sit down and then you just start writing and then suddenly just, it just all this rush of stuff that you weren't even thinking about just kind of flows in is a, uh, it's a hundred percent my experience. Um, I do try to have some consistency of like, I want to try to block off 90 minutes here and just, just sit. If nothing happens, whatever, fuck, life goes on. But yeah. 100% similar to your experience. And I, I actually say the, uh, I know Jim, you're like, if we could just prove this scientifically, it'd be amazing. But this is why I actually think uh, Rick Rubin's book, The Creative Act is such a service to humanity. Great book, great book. Right? It's like, it's short. He doesn't talk about his music career. doesn't talk about any of the music he's created. He's just like, this is my experience over four decades of making some of the most important music ever. And it basically is woo woo. He's like, there yeah. is, th- there is something out there. And your job is exactly what you said, Rob, about McKenna describing Coppola. Your job is to be a vessel for whatever that creative energy is. And he speaks specifically around how he gets people into the right moves. I, he'll talk to an artist and he'll be like, okay, Today, I want you to pretend you're Paul McCartney. Just pretend you're Paul McCartney. Now just do whatever Paul McCartney would do. And he's basically asking the artist to become a vessel. And you're combining whatever you think Paul McCartney is with yourself. And then that now is a vessel for all the experience you've had and whatever you're feeling that day. And then it comes out. This is one of those documentaries. Like if you watch the Rick Rubin stuff or any clips of him recording, it's hysterical. He's just like, he's like lying on a couch. He's like doing nothing. Right. And he's just jamming with these artists and he's just whatever doing his thing. And then they realize that something's hitting, 
something's happening. And then they're all just there to bring it. Whatever the energy is at that moment, they know it's there and they're just going to stay up as long as they have to and put in as much work that they have to to get it to the finish line. He actually has an incredible podcast for Grubin. He had John Mayer on recently and they talk about it specifically around this energy. So John Mayer is just like, yeah, my job is like, I'm just trying to, I'll, I'll be practicing or I'll be writing songs with some of my uh, bandmates or people I collaborate with. And then when we realize that that moment's come, like there's something there, there, we will work. We're batting down the hatches. We'll be there for the next 72 hours uh, just to channel it out. And, uh, and it echoes what you say. It's like, you don't know when you sit down that something good's going to come out. But what you do know is if you don't sit down, nothing's going to come out. Yeah. And uh, your job is to, I mean, talk this isn't you, right? You go to any of the great writers, like any of the prolific writers, uh, who are the best selling authors ever? Like Michael Crichton, Stephen King, James Patterson. Uh, who's the female one that just crushes? I mean, there's all JK Rowling. They're all the same, right? There's like, I write, my job is to write, uh, Stephen King's like, I have to write five pages a day. That's my job. I have however yeah. long that takes, that's my job. And some of it's trash, some of it isn't, but that's my job is to sit down in that seat. So yeah, I think, uh, I don't even think it's just about writing. Like Steve Jobs says something very similar. He's like, my job is to be a vessel for ideas and ideas, many ideas that come before me, uh, I'm hoping to leave ideas for people to borrow and build upon for the future. So 100%, the entire time you're talking, I was just like, I was just nodding. I'm like, oh, this is exactly how it feels for me. What's the Rick Rubin book? Uh, the creative act. The creative, the yeah. creative act. Oh, you will, okay. uh, uh, Rob. Based on everything you've said in the last twenty minutes, you'll I think love it. You'll love it because okay. he literally I'll just like out. he's just like he talks about the collecting of ideas and then just being in the mindset to usher them to. Uh, complete. Yeah, I. What's so funny is uh, serendipitously, I was just talking about him and that book with somebody who hadn't read it, and he's like, "Who? Who is this guy?" And I said. You would never believe it, but he, and then I gave him his CV, right? And he's like, wait a minute. And so I pulled up a picture of him and he's like, he's just like, so this is the guy respond. And I went, yeah, he doesn't read music. He doesn't play an instrument. It's like your idea. He is this vessel for these creative ideas. I think though, what Rob was saying earlier also applies here. It's like, I had this little formula that I wrote out when I was young. It was like energy of uh, mind or thought uh, times energy of action times energy of random events squared. And and basically it was trying to get to the, you can think all the greatest things of the world, but if if that is equals 100, right? And, and energy of action equals zero, 100 times zero equals zero. And so... And and I threw the random stuff in there because, like, I have this theory that you can, you can be luckier than other people if you're paying attention. And yeah. and the reason I squared it was because lots of random shit happens. And if you're paying attention, you can say, "Ooh, that looks like a lucky situation, right?" If you're not paying attention, you're not going to see it, right? We don't see things if we're if we're not looking for them, right? Specifically, but. The other thing there is the, if you multiply by zero, you get zero. And so I think that you, Rob, you're right. You do have to sit down and say, well, use or not, <laughs> I, I, I hope that by just in, in engaging in this exercise, the muses will indulge me. But I, I definitely think there is something to this idea of being open to, you know, that idea that 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 exists external maybe it's you know in the cloud who knows uh yeah. jung's collective unconscious right and yeah. and we always seem to improve our or not improve change our analogies and metaphor to whatever the tech of that day is right so now instead of a collective unconscious we've got uh, shell drake's uh, morphogenic field which people get because they everybody knows about the cloud right yeah. Um, and, and so the, the, the thinking becomes more abstracted, but ultimately you got to put a pen in your hand or open the computer or if you dictate whatever, but you, you, you got to start and that takes action. And so like, I don't care how many great ideas that you have. If you don't take action against them, they're just daydreams. 
I just want to add yeah. to exactly what you're saying, Jim, about uh, uh, how important it is to notice because Rick Rubin actually talks about that extensively in his book. He's like, he says it's particularly difficult to in in the smartphone age with the distractions to literally just notice, just to even be able like like if all if you have nothing else distracting you, like you could marinate on like an elevator song, like you you'd be in an elevator but without forgot your phone. You're just like, oh, this song is kind of dope, but like. You literally just distractions all the time, right? You you don't even have the opportunity to marinate on all these things that are happening around you. And he, he talks extensively. He's like, just when he says be a vessel, it's like, like it's already happening. You just have to pay attention. But most people can't and uh, are easily distracted. I mean, I'm one of these people, right? I'm, I'm very easily distracted. And uh, I, I, man, we might have to do another episode. The kale after. phone and the cocaine phone. Yeah, the, there you go, right? <laughs> I read George, that. That was a good piece. George, <laughs> so our friend George Mack uh, uh, made this great piece about the limiting distraction. Uh, I, you know what? Actually, I I think we have to do another one uh, in the next 12 months after uh, uh, Rob's read The Creative Act uh, because yeah. I would love his thoughts on that. And and your book will be coming out soon uh, by that oh, time, yeah. too. Yeah, so, yeah that's um, right. Some promotion. Uh, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Always be because, selling. Yeah. yeah. Always be closing. I love that. <laughs> right. Always be closing. Always be selling. I actually, I want to bring a. I know that we're running up on time, so I wanted, I wanted to mention yeah. one thing. Uh, I'd be remiss about, and it, it, it's kind of related to what you're just talking about, Jim, and what we all talk about is like being the receptacle. So this is more of a fun fact. Uh, I'll pass it on to Rob after. Is uh, so George Lucas was originally supposed to do Apocalypse Now, like it was, uh, he was, he was going to do it. But uh, uh, the timing wasn't right. And it kind of goes in this idea of like, were you the right receptacle at the right time for this idea? And if you weren't, it passed along. And and I, I can imagine a George Lucas film would have been a lot less dark uh, based on, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, right? It's like based on Indiana Jones and uh, Star Wars, it would have been a much, much different movie. So yeah, those are my kind Interesting. of Interesting. But, but George Lucas that... is also, he's another one of these guys who's sort of known for for the Star Wars movies, the, the hero's journey idea, yeah. right? Where like the apocalypse now, it's almost like a, a sort of a darker twist on the hero's journey of, of Willard and and confronting uh, the, the the shadow. And, and you know, he, that movie was a sort of hero's journey too, but it was just a, a much grimmer, right? Willard is not, uh, you know, he's not quite the same kind of sympathetic protagonist as like a Luke Skywalker type. No, um, Exactly. But yeah, that's yeah, that's how interesting. But, that would have been a very different kind of movie. Actually, hold on. There's one more thing I'll mention about uh, yeah. uh, uh, what you're saying, uh, Rob, about the film, about the journey. So uh, you mentioned earlier that there is a director's cut, a uh, three hours and thirty minutes version. So the 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 famous scene that was cut from it was a film, a scene at a, a French plantation. It's in the documentary. Yes, it so is. So this Ugh. is super. This is super interesting because. Uh, the the uh, the French were uh, colonized Vietnam, obviously, or French Indochina, as it was called, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam in the 1860s. They ultimately left uh, in, in 1954 after Dien Bien Phu, the famous battle. Uh, the Viet- uh, I, I, listen, I get props from my country people. Like they did some crazy shit back then. They were walking artillery all the way up these mountains, like surrounding this French uh, this French army. But anyways, the point being, uh, he described that scene. I found fascinating is that. So they cut that scene out from the original, but if you actually watch that movie, he's like, it's actually going, uh, America going back in time. Uh, so yeah. you'll see the French colony and then by the time you get the Kurtz, it's like tribal, like pre-civilization. Oh, yeah. So like, it's quite, it's like, uh, so the history of Vietnam between, between 1945 and 1975, Vietnam beat uh, three world, uh, four, actually no, called three. If you go with 79, it's four world superpowers, basically. So they took out the Japanese. I mean, I'm saying this, it took out. Like, they got Jap- Japan out of Vietnam, Imperial Japan. Then they beat, uh, they got France to leave. And then America obviously left. And then 1979, the last ra- land war uh, China's ever had was 1979. They sent 200,000 troops uh, down uh, uh, across the Hanoi, uh, so the northern Vietnamese border. And then that was basically, I mean, they took a pretty big punch in the nose and they haven't done a land war since. But the TLDR is like... It, 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 the going through the river was like basically going back in time. So, so interesting. Yeah, I, so- I I love that. And and like uh, 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 I was talking to a young person who uh, had hadn't seen the movie, hadn't read any of the books, and he's like, "Hey, can you just like sum it all up for me?" And I'm like, "Well, no, I, I really can't." He goes, "Come on." And I went, "Okay, here's here's my summation. Do not fuck with the Vietnamese." 
<laughs> yeah, and Colonel Kurtz was right. Remember that. So, so in, in Colonel Kurtz's speech near the end, where he says like the the genius to do like basically these people are willing to do anything to win, and if I had ten, but if I had ten battalions of men like that, this war would be over tomorrow. And he, and this is sort of like why he decided to jump ship. He was like, you know, like the, they're better than us, basically. Yeah, like they have a sort of like a well, the a, situation a that we can't the, recognize, and their the defense, like they had everything we're going for, right? Like the, there's a famous line from Ho Chi Minh, which is famous for all the wrong reasons. He's like, I'm willing to lose ten of my people for one of yours, right? That's like if you stay here, that's what's going to happen. And uh, yeah, and and uh, uh, I guess more infamous is the right line, but to your point, I guess Chris yeah. recognized like this is unwinnable. Yeah, All right, guys. Yeah, yeah. As as usual, these could what 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 are like the longest podcasts? What, how long do they go? This could be one of those. I, oh, we I, could have I, gone like, Lex Friedman, uh, <laughs> Dune Balaji, eight hours, <laughs> yeah, the four hour yeah. the marathon. Oh, yeah. All right, all right. So uh, the the next time up, I, I I maybe want to do a mashup because I just rewatched Mad Men. Rob. Oh yeah. Uh oh, and man. like and all I'm doing is quoting you to my wife because she's like, <laughs> Who who is this guy? And I'm like, yeah. you know, and oh, oh okay. Uh but I'd I'd love to do about one like where we mash up all of these. Uh but yeah. I also Trung is right. Yeah, we've got to get you to read the Rick Rubin. Oh, I would book. love. I would love. And, yeah. and 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 maybe we'll make that our our last one. So you know you know the drill, guys. You you get to be emperors of the world yet again. You get two new inceptions. Uh, Trung, I'm going to start with you. Remember, you can't kill anybody. You can't put them in re-education camps, but you can whisper into the magic microphone. And you will incept two things of the world's population. They're all going to wake up and think, I just had the two best ideas in the world and I'm going to act against both of those. What are you going to, what are you going to incept the world's you population? You know, I was really going to say that, I was going to say you should watch Apocalypse Now and then A Heart of Darkness, but that's a bit of a con. <laughs> so I'll say <laughs> this. I'll say you should read. I said you actually should internalize and read a Rick Rubin's creative act. I think, uh, I think having, and just talking to you guys, having someone, uh, Specifically, when Jim said there's no science around this idea that we're vessels for creativity, it sounds, all sounds like woo woo. But like when a guy like Rick Rubin with his track record, which like he did Beastie Boys, he did Johnny Cash, he did Jay Z, Eminem, like Nine Inch Nails, you you name it across the entire spectrum, right? If this guy is saying this is the way, I'm not saying this is like the word, and you have to follow everything. I'm saying if he's saying that this is what he believes, I'm like. There's something. There's a there there. This might be even better than science. So uh, I would say internalize the idea that uh, we are creative vessels. And uh, I think the more time we can spend at being creative vessels and, and and bringing something, which is whether new or recombinate of something old to the world, uh, it will make the world a richer place. Love it. Oh, we actually have to follow that. Oh, man. <laughs> you do, Rob. I you mean, do. Yeah, because I had to. I mean, okay. So, so my idea, yeah, it's, it's sort of similar, which is, which is, so you're reiterating something I said earlier, which is um, to understand that uh, that you shouldn't wait for creativity to strike you. You just have to show up and and do the work. And through the process, right? This is, I think, this was one of the takeaways from Jeb McKenna's essay is like through the process that creative force will come out through through you know doing doing the work. You you you're not an artist yet until you start doing the work. Um, you don't get to decide, oh, I'll be an artist now and then do it. Um, it doesn't work that way. So it's sort of like, what, like developing or strengthening that understanding, that discipline would be one. Uh, it would definitely would have been useful for me uh, when I was, you know, when I was for, sort of first starting out in writing. And then the second, speaking of writing, is just just to sign up for my sub stack. I'll accept everyone to just keep. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a fantastic, yeah. fantastic yeah. sub stack. It is. I, I need more subscriber. people to market my book to later. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that's right. Well, I will certainly have you on to talk about your book because uh, you Excellent. know I read it. I think it's great. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's a tough book, but it's it's it uh, is yeah. really really good. So I will. Yeah. I will. I will be your shill, Rob, uh, for Love for it. that particular book. <laughs> All right, Perfect. guys, always have so much fun with you guys. Thank you for taking time out of your day. 